Hello, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, let's get started. Um, so I am Deval. Uh, I'm the director of AI engineering at Vector. I spent most of my career at the intersection of machine learning and energy transition and climate adaptation. And I'm super enthusiastic about uh, what is next in terms of where AI can help us uh, address uh, one of the biggest challenges of our lifetime, which is uh, climate resilience, climate change adaptation and mitigation. And this, this conversation wouldn't, couldn't be more timely in the wake of COP26. And for those of you who have been following it, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of good outcomes. And then also a lot of uh, hopes which were not met with COP26. Uh, so what we would want to do uh, for the next 45 minutes is we have some uh, brilliant professionals working uh, in the field of addressing climate change using machine learning and AI and would like to discuss what is the role of machine learning as they see it uh, in climate adaptation and climate mitigation uh, and in general in climate action domain, right? And um, if you can, so we will be using chat functionality for question and answers. Uh, we would love to uh, know where you are all joining from. So I'll just type in a question and if you can use chat to answer that question. Uh, from, and I'll start with introduction. So first with Alix. So Alix's professional background is in consulting as a machine learning technical lead with Deloitte's Omnia AI. Thanks for joining us, Alix. Alik also has experience uh, in, the, in the venture capital uh, arena as a research associate with one of Peter Abel's funds. Uh, Alik is a seasoned AI project leader and educator in machine learning field, and he has taught and developed various machine learning courses at University of Toronto. Uh, Alik is also working on his PhD at the University of Toronto, studying applications of machine learning in quantitative finance, uh, including ESG research. And he is, uh, co-founder and CEO of SREI. Uh, welcome to the panel, Alik. Glad to be here. Hi, everyone. Next, we have Archie. Uh, Archie has a PhD in neuroscience. Thereafter, he moved into commercial data science realm and has spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, applying machine learning in a commercial setting. He has held various machine learning and product roles, uh, leaving Element AI in June of 2020 to focus all his energy on climate change work. And he's currently leading data science at Carbon Chain, building automated carbon footprinting tools. Welcome to the panel, Archie. Thanks very much for having me. Nice to be back in a Canadian context. And last but not the least, we have uh, Samira. Samira is Associate Professor uh, at EDS and Adjunct Professor at McGill. Uh, before joining EDS, she was postdoctoral fellow working with Professor Doina Prickup at McGill Miller. Before her postdoc, she was a researcher at Microsoft Research Montreal. Uh, she has received her PhD from Polytechnic Montreal Miller in 2016 under the supervision of Professor Chris Paul. During her PhD studies, she worked on computer vision and deep learning applied to emotion recognition, object tracking, and knowledge distillation. Uh, welcome to the panel, Samira. Uh, thanks a lot, Deva, for introduction. Samira, you are on mute, uh, just in case if you are speaking. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, I, will, I, I, will I jump can on hear to... Samira, Deva. Oh, is it? Ah, maybe something for myself. Okay, let's let's jump on to our first question, right? So, uh, starting with uh, Archie, right? Tell us, tell us a bit more about Carbon Chain. Uh, you you left a lucrative career to, uh, to to focus on climate change, right? So what you have been up to and and what you are developing and what's the pathway to impact, right? Sure. So um, so carbon chain builds carbon footprinting software. So if you don't work in the field, one of the problems that might not seem like a problem is just figuring out who is emitting what CO two which is harder than it sounds because it's a colorless gas. And so the way that I ended up with Carbon Chain is that I before was working uh, with Al Gore on a project called Climate Trace, 
And that was a coalition of 10 or so organizations who were trying to build this global emissions monitoring system to really get at this question of like, where is the CO2 coming from in the global economy? And one of the things I learned there, so we were using satellite imagery and machine learning to try and monitor various things. So I was focused on heavy industry. And so I was kind of plunged into this world of heavy industry that I'd never interacted with before. My expertise was more on the machine learning side. Um, and what became apparent quite quickly was that there are all of these huge sources of emissions that I'd never heard of, things like making cement and steel. And not only were they very big contributors to global emissions, but they're very hard to decarbonize. And so uh, after working on that project for a while, I wanted to get back into a startup product context. And what Carbon Chain does is build software to allow the consumers of those commodities, like steel and aluminium and copper, to understand what the history of that product has been before it ends up in their hands or in their possession in terms of its carbon life cycle. So we work primarily with commodity traders um, who are buying and selling large quantities of these materials. And we essentially reconstruct the supply chain for them of the things they're buying to understand, did this come from a low carbon or a high carbon place? And that's super important because there's incredible amounts of variance in the carbon intensity of these things. So if you get your aluminium from Iceland, for instance, you're looking at two tons of CO2 per ton of aluminium. And if you get it from somewhere that's using coal power, like perhaps India, then it could be as much as 18 or 20 tons of CO2. So there's a whole order of magnitude difference. So we basically work to make that information accessible to different people in, in the economy. Um, and we use machine learning in a variety of places. There's a bunch of kind of entity resolution here. So we create take information from our clients and we have to match that onto the entities that we have in our databases. Um, and then we use some machine learning to fill in gaps where data isn't available based on other things that we know. Thanks, thanks, RG. Uh, Alik, uh, you you have been tackling uh, this say uh, the challenge of carbon and and climate uh, from from the finance perspective. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, your work and uh, how does it relate to climate action? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the field that I work in is ESG investing. That's environmental, social and governance investing. And essentially, the idea is that investors increasingly want to invest in companies that do good in terms of environmental, social and governance dimensions. Um, there is a big global push for this. Of course, this relates a lot to COP26. This, this has been a, a big issue of discussion and very recently, but even in the in the few years before, the topic, topic has gotten really huge. The problem is that there isn't really good enough information available to tell us how good companies are actually doing across these dimensions, including climate. And of course, we need better tools to understand, to audit how companies are performing. Uh, they need, you know, there needs to be better reporting, but we also need better tools for investors to validate what is being reported, get more recent information so they can um, invest in the right companies and you know from for us out for those of us outside of that world it's critical that we get better at this because it helps align incentives for companies to actually do good and if um not doing well for the environment starts having negative pressure in stock prices that starts having negative pressure on people's bonuses and they're incentivized to, to do better um so giving investors better tools to do this is is a is a nice global way to to align incentives more closely towards meeting meeting our social goals. Thanks, uh, Samir. Uh, coming to you, I mean, you have done some some very interesting research on on climate, uh, weather, uh, and even like forecasting. And can you tell us a bit more about uh, your current focus uh, and and how does that relate to climate action? Um. So, so yeah, I, I started working on climate uh, in 2017, mostly collaborating with the team at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. At the time, we were working a lot on uh, modeling extreme weather, weather events like hurricane from detection to forecasting. Um, later on, uh, I mean, we, we continued with different models of deep learning as they became available from like uh, special temporal models to segmentation models, etc. Since I become prof, um, I started looking at wildfire detection and forecasting. And I had one project on uh, 
food insecurity, basically predicting uh, uh, local swarm attacks in uh, North Africa we, um, using deep learning models. Yeah, that's. Um... Yeah, no, th thanks for sharing this. Again, as, as it comes out, right, this, this is a very complex systems kind of a challenge, right? And, and we cannot think of it in like a single dimension. Um, uh, Samira, like I, I would probably the follow up question on that, like what are you seeing from the academia and research perspective? Uh, what is the algorithmic advances uh, which you now feel are really ready to be applied and create real world impact in this field? So uh, I would say like most of the current advances we have in deep learning is, is already applicable to, to climate. Um, like uh, even two days ago, there is a, I, I saw Google uh, announced MedNet 2, which is uh, reliably forecast for not like 12 hours of, uh, of, uh, of weather information. That's, that's already beating um, by a high margin the, the physics uh, system we had, the ensembling and etc. The only challenge I see for in academic is um, is access to data mostly, or um, probably having funding and attracting researchers. So this, especially the last one, is still quite a challenge to to attract researchers to work on this problem uh instead of any other task that uh, you might imagine in in machine learning so yeah I, I i think while we are on it i do want to thanks for sending in your questions right and so there is actually a very relevant question in chat right now so it's for samira how do ml models compare to empirical models uh so there's a lot of uh, work going on in surrogate modeling right so how do you expedite modeling using machine learning versus physics-based or biogeochemical uh, process-based models. Uh, how do those compare, right? And uh, what are the benefits that you have found in your research using ML models for climate modeling? That's, I think that's a lot depends on what task you're tackling or what sort of data you have. So the, for example, this uh, METS METS, it's, According to to their model, they they perform a lot better. But if you're working on some sort of tasks that not that many, um, like the data is not well defined or like wildfire, I would say, it's so difficult to um, to segment such things. So in that case, maybe like there's a benefit to use. Um, physical uh, simulation or physics models in but given that you have enough data, you you have a good model. I I think deep learning and machine learning should not uh, should uh, benefit from like uh, exploiting some correlation between different sources of data than than having uh, physics uh, physics based uh, like uh, models. I would say, if if yeah. that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, for you, Archie, right? So you you have been looking at supply chain and to hard to kind of update industries. And and this is where, in my mind, like the whole systems level think, thinking comes in place. Like Samira mentioned about, oh, predicting, uh, say, climatic events in certain geopolitical region versus Alik mentioned about like financing. It all connects to how, uh, what is the future of supply chain and future of say green supply chain is being built. So. Can you tell us like a bit more about the approach where you are seeing like machine learning, particularly like adding a lot of value? Uh, and then the other question is, how do you motivate, right? Some of the large, so you work with some of the largest polluters and how do you motivate them to take action? Yeah, so let me take those in sequence. So um, I'd say we use machine learning in two quite different ways. The first is a kind of information retrieval, indexing, and entity resolution level. So the reality is, <clears throat> excuse me, you have a variety of documents which describe 
the supply chain. And then you're going to try and reconstitute the state of that supply chain in a kind of digital twin way. And putting aside the complexity of the carbon for a second, that in itself is, is quite a tricky machine learning challenge. So you have a bunch of somewhat standardized documents, and you're going to try and map them onto a series of locations and processes. Um, and some of those things are automatable and some of them are not. Some of them are easy. So for instance, with the people that we work with, the vehicles often have distinct IDs because they're large ships. And for safety reasons, everyone keeps track of their ships very well. So in that sense, um, that's an easy part. A much harder part is um, there are thousands of cement plants. So figuring out which of the cement plants a particular bag of cement came from is obviously very challenging. The other way that we use it is to fill in the gaps when there is data, ground source, ground truth data that we don't have about the emissions uh, intensity of different things. When I say intensity, I mean ton CO2 per unit of something. Um, so for instance, for ships, uh, there are like 12,000 or so ships who have declared their emissions to the EU. Um, so we can use that as a basis to build a model of all ships um, from which we can understand uh, for a given ship what the likely emissions profile is, even though we don't have the ground truth data for that ship. The second question, um, in terms of what works in terms of aligning incentives, it comes back in part to what Alec was mentioning. So increasingly financial entities are getting interested in the, the carbon and intensity or carbon consequences of their actions. Um, and there's two reasons for that really, in, in my experience. One is a, a reputational thing. So they don't want to uh, be accused of funding loads of dirty things. So that's kind of intuitive. And the other is this idea of transition risk, which is the world is rapidly changing due to climate change. And there's quite a lot of regulatory change associated with that. And things that used to be valuable might not be valuable in two or three years time. And so for instance, if you were a big funder of coal power, um, the, the worry is that you might get kind of caught holding the bag with all these assets that you've given up loans against or invested into that suddenly become worthless because we all decide that there's no future for coal power. And so that is quite a big incentive for these financial institutions to understand the carbon intensity of their activities. But then you've got the problem, which is in they, they're invested in thousands of things or they work with thousands of different companies. And so you've got this really complicated graph that you're going to try and traverse to figure out the carbon intensity of all the things that they're involved in. And so we work with a subset of the nodes in that graph, which are these commodity traders, um, and they take out large loans from financial institutions. And we really work uh, in a kind of triangle with those two organizations. So the banks, in this case, are offering financial incentives to the traders. You know, we'll give you a slight interest rate reduction on your loan if you can tell us the carbon intensity of what you're doing and show that you're trying to reduce it year on year. And so we help them do that and thereby earn this slight carrot. Um, there is, of course, the stick as well, which uh, I don't think COP26 gave us any massive sticks, um, but uh, one hopes that there will be more sticks in the future, which will obviously be a much more direct form of action. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Archie, right? And and on that note, right, so you're right in terms of incentives, like, you know, there's uh, when some of the large institutional investors like BlackRock come out and say that, you know, we want all of our portfolio companies to uh, report their carbon emissions. It's going to be very important in every decision that we make. And then there's also a question here that says reporting activities from financial institutions like uh, TCFD and Partnership on Carbon Accounting, are they enough, right? And Alik, like we have talked a lot about, like this is a complex issue and how do you uh, identify signals, but then how do you also quantify materiality and, uh, and, and you've been working on it, right? So I would be like curious to hear your thoughts on, yes, there's financial incentives, but how do we quantify and make it real? And where are you seeing like biggest opportunities of applying machine learning and deep learning in that space? Yeah, I, um, I, I think there's, you know, there, there's quite a bit to unpack here. So of course, reporting by corporates is important, but as as we get further along, like for example, one of the outcomes of COP26 is, is perhaps more progress towards you know trading carbon credits between countries. That will create perverse incentives as well for folks to hide their their carbon emissions. And it's important for financial institutions to I think to have another view of what is actually happening, especially for example, if dealing with uh, you know emerging markets. Um, so I think reporting will only be one side of the coin, and it's important for all financial institutions to ultimately have ways to audit the investments that they're making and saying, okay, well, yes, we looked at what's being reported, but we also did our due diligence to at least make sure that 
we are reasonably confident that this is accurate or, you know, that we've made sure that this, this is a company that has good governance that is where reporting is likely to actually reflect the truth. Um, there, there is an interesting news article that came out a couple of days ago that I think also related to this about uh, methane emissions around the world. What, what happens, for example, is, is companies shut down like a mine that they no longer report, but there might still be methane emissions from those operations that no longer really belong to anyone, right? And that could is a significant part of global emissions, right? So being able to understand that and what kind of impact these companies might be having that they may not be reporting is, is really important. I, I do think it, it is up to the asset management industry to develop better tools to understand those kinds of things. Yeah, and and where do you see like what are the techniques and what are some of the the algorithmic uh, approaches that you are uh, you're looking at right to identify the signals? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean it's not it's not just one problem, right? Like there there's so many. So I think all of it will be important. We're my company is focused on natural language processing, right? So this is really helping investors understand all the information out there in the public domain that you know things people say online environmental issues that might be happening that take a very, very long time to make it either into reports or into external ratings that might be evaluating companies. Computer vision is another important part of this, right? So sat satellite imagery um, and newer satellites that don't just analyze images, but are also able to detect things like methane emissions, right? This is something that's coming in, coming in a couple of years. It'll require hardware to actually be launched and will require a lot of effort from the machine learning community to make sure that this can be done you know efficiently at scale in a way where we can link it back to actual businesses right because it's only part of the problem to say okay like there's an emission coming from this point in the globe but also who owns this thing right like how do how do you do all of that attribution at scale it's you know it would be very challenging yeah no i, I think uh Yes, uh, data and, and finding that this is obviously a complex problem, right? And there's a question here, maybe Samira, uh, to you, right? So uh, someone would assume that getting weather data is not an issue, right? We collect like a lot of weather data and, and climate modeling has been prevalent for decades now. And so why is obtaining data difficult, right? What are the challenges there? So it's it's quite depends on the task, for example, you want to to tackle. So, of course, the data I think mostly we talk about are the satellite images. Those are those are definitely like from from Landsat. You can obtain them. But imagine that you want to, for example, detect a wildfire. But then from that satellite image, it's just few pixels. Whereas, of course, some companies have like. Um, quantity of how much damage, like financial, those those data are private, we don't have access. But if you're someone from computer vision society that you want to just like forecast and like uh, model this, modeling one pixel is very, very difficult in that, in that case. There are several sources of data, again, if you want to like do multimodal, do like, uh, then then comes the problem of the uh, different scales, different time of um, that the data come from. So they're not, they don't have the same timestamp. They they don't, they're not from the same location. So there's so many challenges in in the data. When I when I say that, I I compare, for example, climate research versus medical imaging, right? So medical imaging already quite ahead in terms of data, in terms of people willing to share the data than, uh, than like climate problems, I would say. Uh, yeah, no, no, thanks. I, I think, uh, yeah, data at different levels, right? Actually, in, in your experience, you work with Climate Trace, which is, which is, I would say, there's a new school of thought around like data-centric machine learning and Climate Trace is as data-centric machine learning as it could get. And uh, what are the challenges there, right? Like with, was it more around data and, or was it more around like algorithms and methods? Sorry, did you say climate risk? Uh, I said climate trace, like you. Oh, climate talking. trace, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the challenges we faced were somewhat similar to the ones Samira describes. Um, but actually, the major challenge that we faced was really getting the ground truth. So uh, I was 
working on algorithms to monitor the emissions of things like steel plants and aluminium smelters and cement um, plants. And the problem is that you're never really going to find ground truth data which describes what's going on at a particular plant or a particular day when you have a satellite image. Um, and so there's a question in the chat about, you know, why is this data hard to come by? And I think it's because so much of the climate change data is tangled up with very sensitive commercial data. And so that was certainly what we saw. Um, so we would speak to cement manufacturers and we'd say, any chance you could tell us you know, roughly how much cement you made that day so that we can build a model. And they'd say, actually, it's illegal for us to provide that information because it's anti-competitive if we start sharing how much cement we made on a given day. So there's all these pretty complicated disclosures that, that get sort of mashed together, which make it very difficult to, to get the ground truth data you need. Uh, even once you've set aside the challenges of getting your sort of features, which in this case is separate. Oh, yeah. And, and Alik, like you are probably on the other end of it, say, how do you generate useful data, right, to make like this decisions, right? And um, what are your uh, experience and challenges in that? Um, well, Actually, sorry, Deval, could, could you clarify like generating useful yeah, data? Yeah, sure. So I think you, you are you're using machine learning to create data, which is then helpful mm -hmm. in, in taking action, right? And so. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, of course. But well, it, it's it's kind of a flywheel, right? Like, if, because of course, we also have our own ground truth generation challenges being a, a natural language processing startup, right? So um, data is useful in in our case a lot of it is ultimately time right so like do we have features within our product that can save investors time and have them go through a, a process that otherwise would be manual the reality of of you know what our clients experience a lot of the time in in the asset management space is that research is a surprisingly manual process right so you might um consume some high level information some high level reports that ultimately is um, something you either don't trust or is not sufficiently detailed and you go through your own essentially manual process of using Google search and, and, and doing a lot of reading that might be redundant, right? Like, you know, reading multiple articles that refer to the same thing or going through 100 pages of a company's disclosure to find some kind of figure, right? So for us, the bar to usefulness is, is this important information that one might have to locate somewhere else? Um, that you know that's in the natural language processing space right so you know we kind of have a, a easy enough thing to measure success against um but in other times of course that that, that might be trickier as well right like especially um esg or, or this information in the finance domain is not necessarily something that leads to better returns right so the the, the benchmark for um especially those companies working on, on more scoring systems, right? Of, okay, how can we create a environmental social governance score for a given company? Um, it's a tricky problem because it, there's not actually anything to measure success against. Like in the credit risk, you know, credit risk score is good if high scores co correlate to low probabilities of default, but there's nothing like that in ESG, right? It's a bit of a catch 22, um, which, which is an interesting philosophical problem in the space in general, right? Like what does good mean? And what is the consensus towards good ESG performance? For climate, at least it's a little bit easier, right? Like you, we just need to measure carbon footprint that companies are having in, in increasingly sophisticated ways. So we understand sort of end to end, okay, like where, where are the, you know, where's the low hanging fruit to help us optimize? Um, but when we get into social and governance issues, it gets even trickier, right? Even more nebulous. Yeah, um, I want to jump into like there's a question here uh, in from the audience is how machine learning models been utilized to capture carbon and climate impact beyond carbon emissions. Right? So we are we are focusing a lot of our discussion around greenhouse gas emissions, be it carbon or methane. Uh, but what are the things like beyond emissions and and things like material decomposition, impacts of remediation, right? And if I were to rephrase that question, like what are some machine learning applications uh, in climate adaptation versus, uh, and one which comes on top of my mind is, uh, is around using uh, computer vision to, to predict and then also other machine learning, deep learning techniques for uh, soil restoration or, or predicting uh, deforestation or, or effects of uh, say land use, land use change and how that can help. Uh, but 
anyone wants to take this one up, like what are the other applications which you see and and perhaps Samira. Um, I I I actually don't know from the computer vision aspect of it. I would say what what we can achieve is mostly like uh, just um, detecting, forecasting, or monitoring. We can probably detect that something got better by uh, some. But it's not it's it's not that easy to to say what what was the cause, you know. So it's it's not that advanced. I don't think if we are there yet to say, like, uh, I'm telling you, like, my my own problem in research is is as simple as uh, the timestamps don't agree, or I cannot fit this much of a data to GPU before aligning them, for example, like. It's still very, uh, uh, from my side, is a bit far from from saying that, I would say. But um, yeah, maybe Alik knows something about. I I think for, so I, I don't know much about like material product decomposition and setup. Maybe Archie knows. Um, I, I would <laughs> say though, um, like I, I think a, a huge opportunity here is actually on uh, consumer behavior, right? And giving consumers better tools to understand what are, it all goes back to supply chain, right? Like what are the supply chain impacts of products are buying and what are the substitutes, right? Like if I want to minimize my footprint, of course, you know, there are heuristics buying local, et cetera, but to my knowledge that aren't really great tools that would say, Hey, like here's a prediction of how likely this product is to have some sort of footprint. And here's how you optimize and here's what you should actually buy. And that would be nice, right? Because I think a lot of us don't have headspace to do it. it it's very much an AI problem, like both to fill in the gaps, right? Like, if, okay, if you know this for 10% of products, you can probably make a great guess for the remaining 90%. Um, and just for, for sort of saving people that headspace of being overwhelmed with, with too much choice and complicated decision-making process. Yeah. And, and, and so actually you mentioned like uh, maybe the prime focus is on like say B2B customers, but, but what does like this whole uh, green supply chain mean for individual consumers? Yeah, so uh, I should first say that those heuristics can be pretty misleading. So for instance, buying local has been much fated as a good option and avoiding plastic is another thing people talk about a lot. Both of them in terms of carbon emissions often backfire. So moving food around on container ships, for instance, is extremely efficient and one thing that often happens in Europe, at least, is that people grow things in greenhouses um, and they have super high emissions because the energy use is through the roof. And then, of course, it gets to be local, but it would be much better to grow it somewhere warm and then move it on a container ship over two months. So just a warning uh, on that one. Um, similarly, with plastic, plastic's really light. So actually packaging things in plastic, you save a bunch of emissions because the thing you're moving around is really light rather than like glass, which is super heavy. Um, so I think nobody has yet cracked the nut of in what domains do consumers care enough that you can extract enough of a green premium to price these products differently and deal with the complexity of those supply chains. Because we work in relatively simple supply chains. You know, the things that we're trying to footprint are like a chunk of aluminium. So there's, uh, you know, fewer than 10 things have happened to that since it was in the ground. Um, and you go all the way up to a MacBook, uh, the complexity well, for Apple is it, somewhat uh, manageable because they are very vertically integrated but for most people that's a really difficult question what are all the things that go into this product and then ultimately does the consumer care enough to pay and I think that is a big unanswered question for lots of people lots of people have tried this in the UK supermarkets 10 years ago were saying we're going to put carbon footprints on things and they gave up because they're like it's really complicated and people don't seem to care that much and so there's a bit of a dissonance between how much we all subjectively feel the urgency of climate change and our willingness to put dollars on the table yeah, no, absolutely. And and on that, like one of the questions which I had, like uh, I'm, I'm, maybe this is an assumption, but a lot of us are following or were following COP26 and all eyes were on, on Glasgow. Um, what what were some of the biggest say, takeaways uh, for you? And where do you see like, 
the highest potential for applying machine learning and, and artificial intelligence uh, on some of the outcomes, right, of, of COP. And I see Ali nodding, so I'm going to start with you, Ali, on this one. Um, if, yeah, my first thought, like in the in the last days, has has probably been around um, like trading, like trading carbon credits, right, and like um, just in helping make things more accurate in that space, right? Um, I, I think carbon credits are interesting because again, they, they have the potential of creating these perverse incentives. Um, but at the same time, machine learning has has a lot of opportunity to uh, just generate a, a much better, more informed market in that space. And I think it'll be a huge opportunity, right? Like assuming carbon trading does that take off, which, which seems to be the direction. Thanks, uh, Samira. Um. Yeah, that's um. From from the work, from the perspective I do, I, it's it's again it's uh it's a very difficult question to to say what we can what we can do from what we have is. As I said, I I, I work mostly on disaster response, so I can only detect or or monitor and and tell you that something is increasing in some regions like uh, but um in terms of um what can be done i'm i'm not quite sure what's uh like what um in terms of disaster response because it's like a you know it's like treating the effect but also gives you some information about the cause in, only in that sense, I can say it can be helpful, but. Um. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, I, I'll share, like I'm, I'm most, I think, uh, I'm, I'm most uh, positive about the methane pledge, right? And so I think it's a, it's a big step in the right direction. It's also, uh, it's also international, right? And so it's not like just say one country trying to do things and now comes the follow-up and i think like machine learning and as Ali, like you mentioned around like things like how do we use uh satellite and drone and, and on-ground sensors and bring it all together to uh, identify and quantify methane emissions right first of all i think the challenge with methane emissions is like um uh, in my previous work i worked a little bit or quite a bit with methane however you want to quantify it's like a lot of times we don't even know how much methane is is being emitted and so even just quantifying methane is a big challenge and that's where i think uh some of this advanced machine learning methods in deep computer vision or time series analysis methods uh, will uh, will play a big role going forward um archie to you what what is what was the most exciting thing that came out of cop26 and where do you see machine learning playing a role in that yeah, whilst well, we're on the subject of methane, I should say that uh, Montreal has one of the uh, leaders in this space from my perspective. So GHGSAT make these amazing methane monitoring satellites uh, and do really incredible work. So worth checking out. Um, so I think uh, I agree with Alik that the, the most important movements were around the carbon markets. So it's obviously it's this huge, big um, global alignment problem that we have. And in some places, it's really cheap to abate, meaning it's cheap to spend money to reduce carbon emissions. And in other places, it's really expensive. Um, and so having really efficient markets so that the people who are in expensive to abate places can move money to places where it's really cheap to abate is going to be really important for our efficiency and fighting climate change. And I think I see the role of ML there, as you were saying, Debel, is, is probably in the monitoring piece. So if... Um, I mean, offsets is a good example. If you're spending lots of money on offsets and you're using that to declare yourself net zero, um, you probably need some form of oversight of where that money's going and whether the trees that you're spending money on you know, are growing and whether they're still um, upright after a wildfire. Uh, and so that kind of mass scrutiny of things, I think is gonna be important for filling in some of the gaps in our trust and visibility of where this money's going and allow us to allocate that capital in a sort of efficient way. Um, and there are companies doing this. So uh, Pachama in California um, 
uh, have built a business doing exactly this and monitoring the forest carbon using a variety of remote sensing techniques and a bunch of machine learning. Uh, and I think that's the way it's going to go um, for a lot of other domains as well. So deployment of renewables, similarly, it's observable. Um, agricultural changes, agriculture is going to be a huge, huge thing in the next 10 years, particularly with methane. Um, and those are, to a large extent, changes that are observable from the sky. So if you're pumping money into somewhere really far away on the premise that they're going to change their agricultural practices in a way that sequesters carbon, um, it's going to be important to build a monitor. And absolutely. Um... I'll leave there's a question for you. So when you see, when you are seeing opportunities in ML for carbon credits, are you thinking it is in quantifying issuing credits, surfacing supply chain, enabling use of credits, or it is just in trading? I think this covers like the, probably the whole carbon credit value chain, but uh, yeah. what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, like I, I'll I'll echo what you know what, what you guys were just saying, right? Like I think the big things are are in monitoring. Um, it, of of course, there there's going to be money to be made in the space in other ways, but if we're talking just in terms of mitigating climate impacts, I think it's all about better information, right? Again, just eliminating those perverse incentives because forcing everybody to pay for their carbon use will create a lot of incentive to just under report your, your carbon use. Right. And, and there, we need ways to, to audit what companies are doing and we need to be able to do this globally. Uh, it's, it's going to be a very, you know, very challenging problem, but one, one will need to solve for this to, to really work. Yeah. Um, we, we did skip some, you there's a question for you. We did skip, uh, one question, where, is, where are you seeing like uh, industries like construction or architecture, like using the research or, uh, or do you see them using the research which, which you are doing and uh, how would that kind of transition look like from research to application in those industries? Um, let me check again. I mean, in in terms of uh, construction and uh, probably again doesn't really uh, directly relate to my to, to what I work on, but um, of course buildings can be um, efficient in terms of uh, energy, in terms of uh, that. Those are the things I would say probably. Um, Makes sense, but but as I as I tell you, like it's it's not like since I work on disaster response, this is uh, this these are a bit different. But again, as Alik mentioned, um, monitoring or just showing something like people might think, um, oh, this this kind of industry is creating uh, pollution, but when you are showing it on a map with data, that's kind of proof. So, so then I think that's why that's important to, to do that so that there, there will be action. Otherwise, talking about things, usually data, when, when you show something with data is kind of, is real, is, is, uh, is when, when people start believing something and taking into action. So that's, uh, the only thing I can say from, from my research side that's just, just showing, just showing the analysis of the data. Let's say uh, from last year to this year, for example, um, this industry is just uh, causing nothing than uh, um, more and more carbon emission. Then, then there will be more and more awareness. I would say in that in that direction. Yeah, but, uh, no, absolutely. I think data visualization is a is a brilliant tool for car like climate action, right? So I think uh, we can all agree on it. Last question for everyone: When do you think we will achieve net zero globally? I'll start with Archie. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, I'll go with 2058. Samira? Um, I don't know. I'm not that optimist about it to say. <laughs> uh, Especially like I'm, you know, I'm I'm originally from Iran, so it's uh, I I don't know. 
probably as much as we can reduce is is a gain. Uh, so that's um... yeah. yeah. Luke? Uh, I it's I don't know. Yeah, also hard to say, but twenty fifty eight also sounds optimistic to me. I, I hope we do. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, twenty eighty would be would be my guess. Uh, just you know, right. long enough that I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I won't. <laughs> it won't be proven wrong in my life. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, my 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 money is on twenty sixty. Right. So close enough, Archie. And let's 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 make that happen. Right. Like I think machine learning and AI, uh, I believe, is one of the most transformative technologies that can accelerate uh, energy transition and and climate adaptation and, and mitigation. Uh, thanks everyone for joining, uh, and thanks for the time. I know you you are on like different geolocations, and uh, for folks who have joined us remotely, you can find us on on the app. If you have any other questions, uh, thank you everyone. Yep, don't thanks, hesitate. Everyone. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yep, same thanks. Thing. Those were two very close guesses, so that's uh, that, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank Bye. Bye. Bye.